Hello, everybody. I think you can hear me. Welcome, uh, all of you. Uh, it's great to be here for me. Maybe I'll just wait about uh, five or ten seconds till the dust has settled down. But uh, yeah, since so you don't have too much time, maybe let's get started. Um, <clears throat> so today, I'd like to uh, share with you a story about um, one of the coolest subjects in AI currently, which is obviously wastewater. Very interesting stuff. Um, yeah, but before we start, let me shortly introduce myself a bit. I'm from the, the Netherlands. I'm a lead data scientist at Data Science Lab. It's a consultancy firm based in Amsterdam. Uh, yeah, a long time ago, I started studied artificial intelligence, but yeah, it was before it was cool, which basically means there wasn't any work in it whatsoever. So to dabble a bit in uh, other subjects, such as software engineering, BI, database marketing, before ultimately switching to, um, yeah, do more interesting stuff. Um, yeah, a little bit about uh, Waternet. That's the uh, water company, uh, a water board for uh, Amsterdam and the surrounding region. So this is um, where we did the project for. Um, so about the company, they, what they do is uh, they're responsible for cleaning drinking water, um, and also wastewater, so the full water cycle. And basically, everything around the sewer systems and dikes and anything that has to do with water. And what's nice about that environment is that they have a, an innovation mindset. They're kind of front runners within the Netherlands, at least, uh, with respect to um, digitization, innovation, and experimenting with AI. Uh, yeah, I'm just going to skip this stuff a bit to save some time. Uh, I had a good joke there, but uh, too bad. I had to skip that, so it's going to be all serious from here. Okay, here we see the wastewater treatment plant in Amsterdam West. That's going to be uh, the place we're looking at uh, here in this talk. Um, yeah, so what do you see there? It's uh, now one of the largest wastewater treatment plants in the region has a capacity for about 1 million people. For Dutch measures, at least, that's pretty big. For in, in international sense, maybe not so much. But um, now you see all those round tanks over there. That's where uh, all kinds of dirty sludge water uh, comes in and gets cleaned. Uh, yeah, the four tanks in the center, they are um, meant for sludge processing. And all the other ones, now, if you would look closely, you could see uh, seven times three tanks. And that's because there are seven parallel treatment lanes that basically do the same uh, stuff, execute the same cleaning process in parallel, where each cleaning process uses three tanks. So we're looking, uh, going to zoom into that a bit. And so, yeah, what... Um, What's going on with that wastewater treatment plant? Why use AI there? Well, it all started with an EU-funded program, which uh, will last about roughly three years. So there's some budget to basically see how we can improve the, the control strategies of the entire facility um, by using AI techniques. And yeah, the goals are to, well, ultimately make everything more uh, efficient and uh, the specific goals are uh, to save energy consumption and also to reduce the, the amount of toxic emissions. So this, uh, such a plant emits uh, yeah, things like uh, well, a lot of CO2, but also nitrogenic emissions like nitrate, ammonium, N2O. So we want to minimize that and also save some costs by uh, looking how we can uh, optimize stuff. Uh, we can do everything at once, so it's in uh, steps. And we're going to start with uh, a specific process first, and then in later iterations, expand the scope and, uh, yeah, continue with it. Okay, shortly, uh, I'd like to show you a bit uh, how wastewater treatment works, roughly, to get an idea. Um, now, there's roughly three stages. So the idea is dirty water comes in from the sewers, and you want to clean it so that it can flow back safely to canals and lakes, and uh, yeah, the first step is about uh, yeah, sedation, that means roughly separating solids from the fluids, 
And the second uh, stage, that's the aeration process. It's a biological process. That's uh, what we're going to zoom into in a minute. Basically, what happens is microbacteria are added to the water, and they do all the work. They, um, they convert um, ammonium to nitrate, but in order to do so, they need oxygen to live. So how can we facilitate those bacteria? Simply by blowing in a lot of air through the water. Um, otherwise, the bacteria would die. And there's kind of a, a balancing act of um, if you blow into little water, the bacteria will die and the water won't get cleaned. But if you blow in too much air, then bacteria will go completely crazy and um, yeah, you end up with too much nitrate, which isn't good either. And well, and after that stage, yeah, more stuff happens, but uh, we're not going to look at that uh, right now. And in the end, we have clean water and uh, also some residue, which can all be reused. Uh, we have biogas and struvite crystals that can be used for um, uh, agriculture and other things. Okay, so now we're going to look into the aeration process of um, blowing air through water. How hard can it be? Uh, now, this is a print from a, now a Scala system, a schematic of what it looks like formally. I redrew it a bit to make it a bit more clear. So what we see is on the left-hand side, you have a couple of blowers, air vents, or big air compressors that blow air into tubes. And then all those tubes, they converge a bit, and then they split up again into seven other tubes. And if you recall, there were seven parallel treatment lanes. So that's why there are seven tubes here, because there's one tube for each lane. And also, I drew them only for a two out of the seven, but in each seven there, it's split into three subtubes. Uh, they, they go to different parts of the installation of the tank. And yeah, the squiggly weird things in the middle, those are supposed to be uh, valves. They control uh, the air inlet. So the most important thing is there's uh, blowers on left hand side, they blow air in and you can control how hard or soft they're turned on. And on the other side, there are valves that you can turn on or off, open and close them to control the amount of air that goes through each specific part of uh, the plant. And yeah, so those are the controls you can use to uh, basically uh, yeah, control the whole aeration process to make sure that the exact right amount of air goes through each part. And in the middle, there's, uh, there are some pressure sensors and also some airflow sensors. And yeah, those red crosses, we'll get to that in a bit. Just uh, shortly, some pictures of what it looks like in reality. In nah, all these closets, they contain uh, the blowers. And then here the air goes through the tubes. It's a lovely environment there, as you can see. And we see one of those um, tubes branching off to a singular uh, aeration tank. And here on top, it's split into three subtubes, and you can see the valves that control the air inlet. And all that stuff is, uh, can be controlled remotely, and uh, we can read the settings from sensors out of databases, so that's all um, quite neat. Now, a view from the top, just to give an impression of the size. Okay, let's get back to this point. Um, yeah, so there, for each treatment lane, there's an airflow sensor that's supposed to measure how much air goes through. Uh, unfortunately, only one of those seven sensors is working correctly. That's the uh, yeah, unfortunate truth about all those sensor stuff. In theory, it's all very nice, like everything can be measured. And as a data scientist, you think, uh, wow, that's great. You got all the sensors, a lot of information. Uh, let's go crazy with data science in here. But now, first, we have to fix some stuff because in practice, all the sensors are, now, have a lot of issues. So only one works, and basically if we want to start optimizing, um, there's some missing information here. One of the first questions they had uh, for this project was how much energy is even consumed by each of those seven treatment lanes? Because uh, if you want to save energy, you got first got to start with uh, the question how much energy is consumed at all by each lane. And yeah, then we can start optimizing and reducing energy consumption 
So that will be the, the next step. So how can we control the blowers and valves in a slightly different way? Get the, in the right amount of air, but with less energy uh, expense. But first, we got to fix uh, the basics. How much air goes through each of those lanes, and then we can derive the energy consumption from it. OK, so how uh, are we going to do that? Well, uh, yeah, the glass is half full. Huh? There's one sensor working correctly, at least. So let's use that to uh, get our training data. Then we can build a model on that and use it to predict the airflow for the other lanes. And yeah, once we have that, it's just an easy, um, easy calculation to compute uh, the energy consumption. Um, yeah, a little bit about uh, nah, the tech stack. Uh, you see some logos there. Um, basically, everything is done on Azure platform. And you do most development work on an Azure Data Science Virtual Machine. And uh, nah, we use Python, obviously. And for this project, the uh, most important libraries were TensorFlow. And for deployment purposes, you also use tools like Docker and Flask. Um, OK, so the model, what does it look like? Uh, yeah, there's an overview right there. I don't expect you to read uh, or understand uh, what it is exactly. I'll talk you through it. Um, but let's start with the most important part first, the inputs and outputs of the model, because there's a slight twist there. Basically, conceptually, the inputs are blower and valve settings, and the output is the airflow, because that's what we want to predict, right? But in reality, there's three inputs and three outputs. And let me shortly get back to here. The problem here is we can't predict all of those seven airflow values at once, because we don't have the right training data for that. So we've got to do it step by step. We can only predict one airflow. And if you want to do so, we make a distinction between the valves that are connected to the treatment lane at interest we're looking at at that moment, and all the other valves. So that's why we have three inputs, one for all the blowers, one for all the valve, the three valves connected to the current treatment lane, and one for all the other valves. And then Y3 outputs, because we're interested in the airflow, but we're also looking slightly ahead, because in the next step, we, don't, we also want to optimize the entire process. And then we want to look at um, a model that can, well, basically model the entire system. So that includes the air pressure and the energy consumption. So we want to predict all the three together. And we know uh, the air pressure it is measured, so we do have the true information, but we want to able, uh, we want to enforce that the model learns the right relationships, because uh, basically blowers blow air in, the valves let them out a bit or not, and together they build up a certain pressure. We want the model to learn that relationship, so that's why we also output the pressure, and of course we output the energy consumption, and also the energy consumption because we uh, ultimately want to minimize that. So that's why we also want to learn that. OK, so what else can we say about the model? Um, it's basically a lot of simply dense layers with uh, ReLU activations to allow for some nonlinearity. But we do want to use some uh, domain knowledge about uh, the physical dependencies that we can uh, put into the model. Uh, for example, we know that uh, the pressure, it depends purely on um, the blowers and the valves, because together they build up the pressure, there are no external factors. So if we know that, we can say, well, uh, there's no bias in that layer, and also since there's a strictly monotonic relationship between those factors, we can impose non-negative constraints on the weight, and all that stuff that um, yeah, that helps training, it helps uh, speed up training, and you kind of make sure you learn the right relationships there. Uh, another thing is uh, oh yeah, scaling, scaling of the input values that's done inside the network. So that's just to eliminate uh, a separate pre-processing uh, phase. So we don't need any additional computations outside of the model, outside of the network. And then about, a little bit about the output layers. Uh, we use a linear activation for that. And uh, there's one small but neat but important trick 
learned from Andre Carpathy. Uh, he basically suggested if an output, for example, the airflow can be arranged between 0 and 11,000. And that's cubic meters per hour of air. That's the unit. But if we want to um, yeah, learn a model to output such a value, it won't easily come up with such a big value by itself. So how can you uh, fix that? We use a bias initializer and set the value to the expected or mean output value. And that really helps uh, training for your model. And also, since we have three outputs, it's important to um, tune the loss weights because uh, we have one optimizer which has to optimize three different losses. And how do you combine them by tuning the right weights? So we spend enough, yeah, put enough focus on each of those three. And yeah, further, we simply use the normal, I'd say, atom optimizer. And ultimately, uh, well, that worked pretty well. Here we see now the blue line is the true signal, and the red line is the model prediction. True signal is a bit more noisy, but uh, some pretty good uh, error values. And the outcomes have also been validated by uh, domain experts. And they were uh, pretty uh, satisfied about that. Uh, so that's nice. And so then it was time to deploy that model. I want to share a little bit about nah, deployment, how that works. In uh, this setting, uh, we deployed as an API, also in Azure. Um, yeah, that works is we provide an API for giving the model predictions, and it's called by a system. Uh, the system reads, uh, reads the, the sensor readings, calls our API to get uh, airflow predictions, and writes it back to the system. And so all the process operators and analysts that work in the treatment plant can easily access the model predictions to look at those instead of the, the failing sensor values. And yeah, technically how it works, you have a simple Python script to get predictions. And we add a small API script written in Flask to develop a simple API. And yeah, to package everything together, to replicate the environment, you use uh, Docker. And in addition also Azure pipelines to um, now develop build and test pipelines to uh, enable yeah, continuous integration and continuous deployment. Um, okay, yeah, but so if you recall, that was just uh, yeah, the first part. It was, it was just fixing the basics so far. Um, I mean, we got this, that's nice, but that's not what we wanted to achieve. What we want is optimize that whole thing. So how are we going to do that? Um, yeah, we uh, looked uh, towards reinforcement learning in this case. Also experimented a little bit with CEM, cross-entropy methods. It wasn't too stable. Want to look at um, evolutionary strategies as well, but um, also for the long term, we're going to look at the reinforcement learning. Who here in this room has was kind of familiar with reinforcement learning? Okay, a couple hands. And who has ever worked with it? Well, it's still no, it's relatively more. It's, it's kind of the ugly duckling in uh, machine learning. Usually, uh, we have supervised, unsupervised learning, and this stuff. Doesn't always work in practice uh, yet. Um, yeah, the concept, so just to summarize quickly, the, the concept is basically very simple. We have an environment in which we operate. The, the system, our system is in like an agent that acts in that environment. It has to continuously choose the right action and get some feedback from the system. And based on that feedback, it can evaluate its own behavior, saying, well, this action, was it a good idea or not? and it can adapt its own behavior based on that. So how does that translate to our case? Um, yeah, it's kind of here uh, in this uh, loop in a couple steps. First, we need to observe the required airflow. As you recall, um, we need to blow in the exact right amount of air, and not too much, not too little. And uh, the required airflow that's derived from other sensor readings, it's uh, Nah, it's done in the next stage, but let's assume it's a given for now. And also the, the rest of the state that we observe is everything around blower values, air pressure and stuff like that in the current state. Then we have to choose new control settings. So we have to choose an action. And once we do, 
we want to be able to observe what the airflow and the energy consumption is as a result. Well, how can we do that? That's why what we use the, the model for, for, that we just built in the first part. And then we can evaluate that result and uh, adapt our own behavior and iterate that whole process. That's basically the idea. And how that works exactly? Well, we use the DDPG algorithm for that. It stands for Deep Deterministic Policy Gradient. Um, it's not very well known, but it's very similar to Q-learning. Uh, that's much better known. Q-learning is the algorithm that's, uh, that's also been used by OpenAI to learn to play all of those Atari games. And it's basically the same you know, conceptually, only it's suitable for continuous action spaces, because um, what that means um, if we choose an action, it's not we either go left or right or stand still. No, we have uh, six blowers, and they uh, need to be set to some value between 100 and uh, 0 and 100%. Same for all those valves. So we have, at least theoretically, an infinite amount of possible actions. So, yeah, in the mathematical terms, don't want to throw formulas uh, at you, but this is a very simple one. The Q function that basically says how good is a certain action in a certain state. That's what you want to model. Well, um, roughly we have a Q function available using the model built in the first part combined with some evaluation. And yeah, if only we could try out a few actions and choose the best one. Uh, but a kind of a fix for this in the DDPG is uh, to split your agent into two parts, like an actor and a critic. The actor really chooses the action ultimately, and the critic is responsible for evaluating the result. And they, uh, they work together, they are uh, trained iteratively, uh, one by one. And yeah, the algorithm also entails a couple of additional tricks to uh, make it work in practice. Let's see what we're doing in time. Um, yeah, and the implementation, uh, th what's uh, good to know as a practical thing is there are roughly two separate code bases, one for the environment, and um, you have OpenAI Gym, that's like a standard format for that environment. The environment basically means they make explicit what your states look like, what your actions look like, etc. And also the model from the first part is implemented in this environment. And then it, the agent itself is implemented using a, uh, a library that uh, supports this algorithm. And yeah, so the actor and critic, what the, do they look like? They're two separate neural networks. They're pretty simple neural networks. And the most important thing about that is for the actor, the input is a state and the output is an action. So it directly uh, implements the policy, so to speak, directly has to choose an action. And the critic that looks at both a state and an action and it maps the rewards to it. So it learns, tries to learn that relationship. And uh, yeah, the gradients from one are used to update uh, the weights from the other one. And um, yeah, maybe one important tip here is we didn't uh, try to train from scratch but we try to pre-train the model by uh, using the, actually the current control strategy because obviously the wastewater treatment plant, it's already working. So we looked at how is it being controlled currently. Uh, it's not optimal, but it's better than random. So we looked at the current behavior and um, trained the model, pre-trained the model on that behavior to get a fair starting point. And also, when you train reinforced learning algorithm, basically the only thing you get back is a, a reward signal. And yeah, that's, you don't really see too much uh, from that. So we built a little monitoring tool. That's basically a visualization of uh, what's going on. Um, yeah, so that helps to try to understand the model, see what's happening inside. We see uh, all the blower settings, the valve settings, and yeah, I think I need to speed up, so let's shortly skip this part here. Um, uh, yeah, I'd like to spend uh, the last couple of minutes maybe on uh, some learnings. 
which uh, might be uh, hopefully helpful, helpful in a way. Um, one important aspect was the, yeah, the domain knowledge. In this case, uh, there were a lot of experts throughout the organization who are um, knowledgeable about certain parts of the wastewater treatment plant. But if you ask them a question, they all, yeah, they all give different answers to the same question. And it took quite some time to really find out specific answers to, OK, so which, uh, what's the right code for this sensor? Um, how does it work? Which is, what is dependent on what? And where can I find this? Yeah, uh, it took uh, ultimately a couple months to really get the truth uh, uncovered about the inner workings of the plant. So that was kind of surprising. Also, um, you can't really assume that all the data from those sensors is reliable. Um, they can be very noisy, they can be stable at first and suddenly go completely crazy out of nowhere. And you have to know about that. Uh, also, things like sensor creep, where they basically have to be recalibrated every week or month. So that's stuff we had to fix. Um, data augmentation, also in, an important one. Um, because when we trained the first model, it's trained on uh, nah, certain training data, observations from the current workings. And the reinforcement learning algorithm, it tries to experiment. It has to find, yeah, it doesn't only look at the current behavior, but it has to find new and better ways to improve. So what it does, it experiments with some weird actions sometimes, um, actions that the model hasn't seen before. And yeah, what we saw was sometimes it just, it wants to reduce energy consumption, so it puts the blower values to zero. That's great for energy consumption, but according to the model, it's still result in a certain air pressure and airflow, which of course is impossible. Um, so that's where we learned from, well, you have to do some data augmentation to make the model generalized better. So we can add data and use the whatever valve settings, but if we set the blowers to zero, you know there can be no airflow. So the target airflow should also be set to zero. So yeah, you increase uh, your training uh, data with that and make your model generalized better. Um, yeah, also a nice one. Who has seen the blog post by Andre Karpathy about recipe for training neural networks? No, a couple people. I can really recommend it uh, if you're training a neural network. He has some really good practical pointers that, uh, that help you with the right approach to get to uh, a working model. So no, check it out. And yeah, OK, um, what I found is building a neural network, training it, uh, you have uh, your training loss, you have your validation loss. It's still a bit of a craft to get working rather than exact science. But by now, it's kind of a solved puzzle. We know how to, to get there at some point. With reinforcement learning, it's a bit different because you only have a reward signal. And in general, reinforcement learning is still kind of in its infancy. There's not a lot of online to find, and not a lot of similar applications you can find. So you're on experimental territory there. Um, yeah, I think we uh, need to leave it at that. If you have any, uh, you want to know anything more, I'll be around during the conference. Look me up, or otherwise on LinkedIn. Yeah, I have okay. a couple of questions. Okay. So uh, that's why, uh, and we're a little bit little bit behind the schedule, so really quick. Okay, How many sorry. data points do you have, say, per minute? Per minute? Yeah. OK, it's just uh, no, one, it's an easy answer. Yeah, just one per minute. Um, yeah, in addition, for it, we used about uh, one year of training data. So that's, yeah, not a whole lot, but uh, it's enough. OK, how yeah. do you reward, uh, how do you define the reward for the critic? I don't know what would that be. How do you define it? The, yeah. OK. Um, not sure I totally understand the question, but um, yeah, the reward is a function based on, the, um, on the, the airflow. It compares the required airflow with uh, the actual airflow. So there's a simple difference function there. And we add to that the energy consumption. And it has to be uh, yeah, normalized in a way, of course. So, yep. yeah. Plenty questions for you here, but we have okay. no time. So I'll present yeah, you with okay. the certificate. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> All right.
That was Robert.